Good morning. I realize some of you don't know that there's a soccer World Cup championship game happening right now, and we're so glad you're here. Uh, for others of us, we're more aware. And although I've got to say I have an interest, there's no place I'd rather be right now than here and focusing on Jesus, focusing on Jesus. And I say that as a testimony because for many years, soccer was an idol in my life. And now I enjoy it, but there's no idol going on anymore, and I'm grateful. So we are looking forward to this week and all the significance that we have this week. And as we celebrate Jesus and his birth, uh, we are going to look forward to Saturday at 1, 3, and 5. Let's all invite people together. Amen? Not just one or two of us, but let's all do it. Here's a couple ways you can do it. One, you can take what we post online and just share it. And you probably have hundreds or maybe even thousands of people that through social media, you're going to post it and they're going to be aware and feel invited that way. For other people, you can start to text. And that's what I was doing this weekend, just texting people, inviting them, letting them know. And then, of course, really the best way is personally to say, hey, do you want to ride with me? Do you want to get breakfast first? Can I take you out for breakfast? Can I meet you there? you want to sit together? That's, that's really the best way, but I'll tell you all three ways. You drop those nets, you invite in love, and trust God with the results. And God will do far more than you can imagine when you take some relationship risks because heaven is full of people where it started with one invite. Just saying, you want to come with? You want to check it out? You want to hear about Jesus? And this is the day Christmas Eve that most people are going to be responsive even more than any other day. So let's not snooze through this week in terms of what God's doing in building this kingdom. We look forward as we're praying for the special services coming up this next weekend. Praise the Lord. Right now we're in this series, Holy Moments. And holy moments are those moments in life where it's so clear and we see how God intervenes. And as you look back in your walk with God, you could probably name dates and moments where God's presence, his power, he intervened in your life. And as you become more aware of these holy moments, you actually see that they're happening daily. They're happening all the time. And then this awareness and appreciation grows of God. And they're not just a couple moments, but moments like this right now where you draw near into God's presence because it's both God pursuing us and we pursue. God. And as you become more aware and appreciative of God's presence and these holy moments, it develops a greater trust, a deeper trust in Jesus. And that's where we want to go in this series, where we're deeply trusting Jesus. Today's text is Matthew chapter 1. And what's beautiful is there's so many Christmas texts, and they're so rich. There's so many layers. There's so many different angles. And this is a text that's just saturated with goodness. And we're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 1 and talk about the upside-down Christmas. The upside-down Christmas. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for loving us and uh, God that you are consistent in our lives when our emotions and situations and relationships and jobs and everything else is fluctuating, sometimes unpredictable, sometimes disappointing, God. You are steady, you are faithful, you are good, you are worthy of our praise and we will honor you today, God, with our hearts and our lives. May you be lifted up in this place, Jesus. May you be known and celebrated, and we give you thanks together. In your name we pray, amen. Is there any part of your life today that feels kind of upside down? Things aren't where you wanted them to be. And how do you walk with God when life gets difficult? What does it look like to trust God when you really don't like how some things are going? And it's out of your control, and you're wrestling through it at the core you know God is still with you, God still loves you, and God has a plan. You have an anchor for your soul in Jesus Christ. And the holy moments that God brings into our lives, they build up a confidence in God. As you're reading through the Bible and you're seeing one after another, after another time that God intervenes, it builds up confidence in God. And that confidence in God is so essential because it leads to a consistency in your walk with Jesus. Confidence in God and his promises and his word and his presence leads to a consistency where you're abiding with Jesus. You say, well, you don't know my situation or what I'm going through right now. 
So let's dive into three specific situations today. Three specific situations where life kind of feels upside down. And they're happening, they're happening right here as we look at Joseph and Mary. And we get to walk alongside of Joseph and Mary and see how they respond to be inspired and learn from them as well. Now we're in Matthew chapter one, starting in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. The first situation that's gonna hit you frequently in life, it's not what you planned. Is anyone in the middle of something right now that you can just say, this is not what I planned? The context for Matthew chapter one is they were pledged to be married, betrothal. Anytime there's a new word, you might wanna check out and research, is it also a different custom? What does it really mean when two people are betrothed? Well, there were different traditions. There were arranged marriages. When I was growing up as a student and a young adult, I thought it was a terrible idea to have arranged marriages. No interest. Now that I'm a parent, doesn't look like such a bad idea. I gotta tell you, my heart's really changed on this whole tradition right here. I'm really quite open, actually. Uh, more than open, a little eager. Uh, well, that was the tradition there. The tradition exists in many cultures today. And then they had contracts and they had covenants. And they were considered married at that point. And there was a public announcement. And they were announced to be husband and wife. Now, they didn't consummate and celebrate that union and marriage yet but there was a declaration, the contracts were there, the arranged marriage happened, they were called husband and wife, but here's the interesting twist. Are you ready for the twist? After the declaration that they are husband and wife, they will remain in their own homes for one year. Woo, who wants to sign up for that deal, right? Congratulations on being you know, engaged and betrothed, and now a year of waiting where she is with her parents and he is still with his parents. What a year. Why in the world would you wait a year? To demonstrate your purity and demonstrate your faithfulness to the other person. One year to demonstrate your purity and demonstrate your faithfulness to the other person. God's plan for marriage there's a lot of different cultural nuances, but when I'm talking about God's plan for marriage, it's this, the covenant and the commitment come first, and then celebrating physical intimacy comes after that. That's gonna always be God's plan for marriage. That never changes, but what do we do? We flip it, don't we? We flip it, why? Because we think we know what's best. Marriage is a gift. God designed marriage. God knows marriage. God knows what's best. But what do we do? We consummate it physically, try it out physically, and then eventually we consider a covenant and some commitment. And when we make that commitment, it's not like the ultimate commitment like God really has in mind. It's more of like a commitment that, you know, we hope, a little more than casual, but you know, we, we hope that commitment lasts. But the bottom line is we want what we want when we want it. And when we make a commitment, we still wanna be able to want and have and change what we wanna change when we wanna change it. And as you read this story, it's just such a contrast between God's design and so often what we see today when it comes to relationship, dating, engagement, and marriage. And there are some things that are cultural and those can move around, but God's word, God's standard, God's truth, God's plan, God's wisdom will never change. And there's tension in that, isn't there? You can kind of feel it in the room. There's tension in that. Listen, if you messed up, there's grace, there's forgiveness, there's mercy. Just come to Jesus, follow his plan. But I'll tell you the tension, not just in that area, but in all areas of our life, is here's my plan and here's God's plan. And that's the tension Joseph and Mary have. Here's my plan, here's God's plan. Do you feel that tension? I want to declare to you today that you can't have both. 
all the time. You just can't. There's gonna be times when your plan and God's plan are perfectly aligned, and that's awesome, because that's just so much easier. But there's gonna be a whole lot of times when your plan is going this way and God's plan's going this way. Your desires are going this way, God's wisdom's going that way, and what are you gonna do in that moment? Worship is when you say, God, I'm going with your plan because I trust your wisdom and your word and your goodness, so I will go that direction. But I'll tell you, there are gonna be so many times in life where you can't have both. And you're gonna need to decide, and there's a crossroads, and there's a crossroads here. And now as we read this for Mary and Joseph, okay, God, you're changing the plan. You're changing my plan. And for them, it's gonna be so difficult. When we talk about a change of plans, some of us are a little more thinker, bent, and so we're thinking logically, all right, that plan changed, pros and cons, this plan, logical, 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 and we write it out. There's other of us uh, that are bent towards emotion, and we say change of plans, that just hits right away emotionally. Well, the truth is it's a both and. There's a lot of logistics to think through in this change of plans, and there's also a lot of heart. This dream that they had together, Mary and Joseph, will be forever altered. This relationship is one where they're fully invested. And when we read the phrase in this passage, Mary was found to be with child. We kind of think, oh, hit the Christmas carol. You know, put that verse on a picture. Oh, I love that. Mary was found to be with child. And there's one part of it that's awe and wonder in a holy moment, 100%. But sometimes what we overlook is there's also another part. As Mary's found to be with child, Joseph, probably heartbroken. Disappointment. This isn't my plan. Mary's with child? What do you do when you're disappointed? How do you respond? You've probably been disappointed 30 times this year. How are you responding to that disappointment? Will you still trust God when you're disappointed? Will Joseph still trust God when he's incredibly disappointed? The emotive part of our life is significant. We love God with our heart and our mind. And sometimes our hearts go going astray. Sometimes our minds go in a different direction. It takes a lot for our hearts and minds to align and trust God. And then here's another twist. At the end of the year, remember how they did marriage at that time. At the end of the year of waiting, purity and devotion, this is what would happen. The husband, it would be a grand procession going over to his bride's house, parents' house with a grand procession and celebration. It would be a day like no other day. It'd be one of the greatest days. It would be a holy moment because why? What would happen then? He would bring her to his home and they would consummate the marriage and they would be together all their days. Now I've got to point out the parallel here. Jesus Christ right now is at the right hand of the father. And do you know what our name is and our identity is? We are the bride of Christ. Now I know if you're a man, sometimes you hear that phrase. It's like, oh, I'm trying to kind of What am I again? We are the bride of Christ. What does that mean? It means spiritually, there is a heavenly marriage coming up in a celebration like no other celebration. And Jesus right now is with the Father and in right hand there to the Father on the throne. And right now we are the bride. And there was this time, just like there was a time, a one year of waiting for purity and devotion. We are the bride of Christ. And in this time of waiting right now, the way we live our lives matters. And what should be exuded right now is purity to Jesus, devotion to Jesus as we look forward to his return. The bride of Christ. What kind of a bride are we right now? Purity in devotion. And we read this is all from God through the Holy Spirit. Not all changes are from God. Be discerning, Joseph. Be discerning, church. What's coming at you right now, is it from God or is it not from God? Because there are some tragedies that are not from God. There's an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's not coming from God. There are people that sin against other people. That's not coming from God. Now, God still brings a greater hope than that. God can still redeem out of the mess. God can still bring grace in the tragedy. But not every change is coming from God. 
So as we discern that, the holy moment again, God, if you're in it, if this is your plan, I'm in it too. I'm in it too. If this is your pick for me to be married, I'm in it too. If it's your pick for me to wait till marriage, I'm in it too. God, whatever you want me to do with my career and gifts, I'm in it. God, however you want me to serve this church, I'm in it. God, whatever your plan is, not my plan, but your plan, then I'm in it for that plan. That's worship today. That's worship. And often in life, it's not gonna be what you and I planned. And if you just sit on your preferences, you'll sit like this in life. (laughs) And you'll sit grumpy because I've got preferences and I've got a plan and I'm not showing up unless you do it, God, just like I want it. And you'll live that way. But instead worship is, God, are you moving? Then I'm moving too. I'm moving to. So there's worship today. Uh, The second part of this, I told you it isn't gonna be easy because this is upside down, upside down Christmas. The second part is it's not what you wanted. Not only did you not plan it, it's really not what you wanted. So now in verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. A betrothal is only broken under two circumstances. One is death, The other one is unfaithfulness because one of the two is unfaithful to the person they're betrothed to. Now, when that happens, uh, there was severe punishment. Jewish authorities, there could be a stoning and even a killing of the person who is not faithful. It was taken very, very seriously. Nothing casual about being unfaithful in that culture. The punishment was high. And Joseph was very aware of all this, but because he loves God and because he loves Mary so much, he's choosing to go a route of doing it quietly. Notice his love for Mary. Notice he's not carrying resentment, bitterness, and revenge. Some people in this room, I guarantee, need to worship God today without resentment, bitterness, and revenge. You need to let that go so you can enter in with a full love in the situations and relationships that God has brought into your life. Joseph is gonna continue to think of Mary and the highest for Mary, even though he doesn't have the answers, even though it doesn't look good. He's given her the benefit of the doubt. He doesn't understand everything. It's not what he wanted, not what he planned, but he still cares so much for her. And he's showing that. He has well-intentioned, limited thinking. Have you ever had well-intentioned, limited thinking? where something's a mess and you're like, God, step back, step back, God. This is a little too big of a mess for you. (laughs) I'm gonna take over right here, God. I'm gonna take over right here. I'm gonna need to sort this all out myself. And he's thinking through, I know there's two options and he's got very limited thinking. He's trying to step in and be the solution and to some degree the hero, but his thinking is I either divorce her publicly or I divorce her quietly. It's either this or that. Publicly, whoo, that's gonna be a mess. I know what's best. It's not easy, but I'm gonna divorce her quietly. That's what's best. Have you ever already decided and concluded you know what's best and God's looking at the whole thing like, that's not what's best. (laughs) That is not what's best. I'm glad you convinced yourself and you're trying to convince everyone else around you. You won't convince me, God says, because that just isn't best. See, in Joseph's mind, it was this or it was that. Two options, this or that. In our lives so often, it's this or that when God is saying, there's actually a third choice. There's actually a third space. This is where the Holy Spirit's moving. This is where the Holy Spirit's leading. It's not just this or that. There is a third choice. And God is often in the third choice when we say it's just this or that. You know, the disciples, as they viewed Jesus, it's either this or that. Jesus, either you don't go to the cross. We don't want you to go to that cross. Or if you do go to the cross and lay down your life and you're murdered and you die, then you're probably not our savior. It's either this or that. Either you don't go to that cross and you show that you are God right now. Or if you go to that cross, then... You're gonna be killed and then where's the movement? 
It's not this, it's not that. Jesus says, actually, he's gonna go to the cross, he's gonna die and through death defeat death because he has a plan that's far above our thoughts and our ways. You see, we've got to open up to the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I believe that there's a lot of people today, life feels upside down, life feels crazy. So they're trying to decide, should I retreat quietly or should I retreat and really grumble? Those are my two options, you know, 2022, going to 2020. I'm either gonna retreat from this culture that seems to be more and more ungodly, I'm gonna retreat quietly and try and find a few Bible verses to back that up, or I'm gonna retreat grumbling. And I don't care if the Bible says don't grumble and complain. I, I got some grumbling I wanna do. Those are the two options, most of it. this or that. You know what God's saying? You advance full of faith. God doesn't give you a spirit of timidity, but power, love, and a sound mind in you with love and truth. You're a culture changer, and this is your time to shine the light of Jesus. That's where God is moving. You see, God wants to redeem situations that sometimes we write off. We write it off, we think it's closed off. Listen, if you have a weakness, God's power can flow through that weakness. If you've been through a trial, you've learned some things. You can minister to some people who have been through that trial. When people declare in your life, you know, I had one person declare, if that doesn't happen by age 40, that's never gonna happen in your life. Well, actually it did happen and it was after age 40, praise God. You know, people are gonna try to squeeze, box, put that thing into either this or that, and you can't limit God. You just can't. And the truth is we need God's guidance, just like Joseph and Mary needed God's guidance. We need God's guidance every day far more than we're willing to admit. So what would Mary and Joseph tell us today? They would say, be teachable, be teachable. Be open to the Holy Spirit. Be listening closely to God. Make sure that the voice of Jesus is more clear and louder than any other voice in your life. Don't run after what people are saying. Be faithful to God because God does far more than we can think or imagine. And sometimes initially it's gonna be not what we planned and sometimes not even what we wanted. And if for you, the year 2022 has felt like a year that there's been so many things you don't really wanted, I encourage you today to draw close to Jesus and abide with him. Receive fresh vision for God wants to do things in you and through you and there is so much more. And the more we trust God, the more God is gonna be glorified in our lives. So let this be a pivot point and a holy moment as we decide to trust God together. There's a third element here and it's not making sense to you. When things are happening that are not making sense, in verse 20, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I like it that Joseph considered this. Mary ponders these things in her heart. You know, it's so important to get that time alone with God, quiet time to process, to ponder. Uh, that's what they're doing. And life happens so fast and there's so many different moving pieces. You need that space to meet with God and listen and process and consider. That's a big reason why I take walks. When I take walks, no one else is there. It's just me and God. And most of the time I'm just listening and I'm processing. God, this just happened. This doesn't make sense. God, guide me through this. That sort of thing, that sort of processing is so essential. If you don't process with God, you don't have a time where you consider this, where you explore this, where you process this with God, you know what happens? You get all stuffed up. You ever been stuffed up <laughs> the last couple months where it's just like stuffed up, stuffed up, it's miserable. You're just like emotionally in life, it's just like you're all stuffed up and you gotta work through some things with God. You gotta give him some things and give him some burdens, give him some praise, give him some thanks, confess some things. You gotta trust some things with God so the Holy Spirit starts flowing in your life again. Don't get too stuffed up. There's a lot of situations that wanna stuff you up. Now, God communicates here through dreams five times in the first two chapters in Matthew. God is communicating through dreams, also angels. 
Angels are supernatural messengers. They protect. They have so many purposes in the scripture and they're real. They're real. You know what I find interesting is how many times Christians, and I'm talking about Bible believing, Jesus following Christians make statements. God can't do that. God can't do that. God can't communicate through dreams. Have you read the Bible? (laughs) Have you read how many dreams God communicates through? God can't communicate through dreams. God doesn't send angels today. Just because you haven't seen one visibly that you know of, you're saying God can't send angels today? I'm saying God has sent angels today. God sends angels today. And when your eyes are opened and you enter into heaven, you're gonna see how many times God sent angels. I I tell you, there's people today who say, well, the Holy Spirit doesn't communicate. The only communication is through the word. The Holy Spirit doesn't communicate to God. I say, just show me the passage where it says that. Uh, There's no healing today. There's no healing today. God doesn't heal today. Oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Well, God can't do miracles today. Really? Where's your passage for that? Uh, God can't use that person. God can't turn around that situation. God doesn't give any of those gifts today. God doesn't do that. God hasn't brought that calling Over and over again, it's the God can't do club. (laughs) Have you hung out with them? The God can't do it club. God can't do it. God can't do it. You know what? I'm gonna go with the Bible instead of opinion every time. I'm gonna go with the Bible over humanistic, theological, pseudo-theological systems that people set up. When so many Christians today say, there's no real virgin birth, God can't do that. I'm like, what God are you worshiping? Not only is there a virgin birth, but there's a death on our behalf and there's a resurrection too, and heaven is real as well. You know, the gentleness of God to say, do not be afraid, because he understands. And he knows sometimes we're fragile. Don't be afraid, there's shepherding, there's comfort. This is God whispering faith over fear, faith over fear, faith over fear, Mary and Joseph. And some specific steps are revealed. Joseph, here's two steps. First of all, you bring Mary home as your wife. Second, you name that child Jesus because he's gonna save his people from their sins. I'm gonna give you two steps. Well, sometimes don't we want 20? Well, God, I want the whole enchilada. I'm not taking a little bite of this, bite of that. God, don't you love me and trust me? Why don't you show me all 20? Well, God's shown you two. You're gonna be faithful in those two? (laughs) Cause you'd be faithful in those two, he might show you two more. You'd be faithful in those two more, he might show you two more. But he's gonna show you a little at a time to see if you're not faithful with a little, why are you gonna give a whole bunch? Parents, if your kid isn't gonna be faithful in a little, you're not gonna go, take it all, take it all. No, you're gonna walk with it. So, so be faithful to take Mary home as your wife because that's a difficult step in the reactions you're gonna receive. And then be faithful to call this boy Jesus. Don't call him Joseph Jr. <laughs> <laughs> Don't come up with your own clever name that's that's a popular name right now. No, you call him Jesus. You got two jobs, Joseph, right now. You got two steps. Maybe God hasn't revealed three, four, five, 16, and 20 for you yet, but will you trust him with the two he has revealed? Will you do the two he has revealed and then trust him with the other 18 that are coming? Because at the right time, he's gonna show you the other 18, but God often starts with two. And is God gonna put you in situations that are difficult to explain? Yeah, he will. Yeah, he will. How are you gonna explain the virgin birth? And just get everyone to understand and get everyone to like that and get everyone to trust you and think that's just really great. How are you gonna explain all that? No, you just can't fully explain everything God's doing. He'll put you in that situation so that you trust him. You trust him and you keep trusting him. And this glimpse ahead with the name Jesus. The name Jesus means savior. It means Jehovah saves. There's no other name like the name of Jesus. 
So at his birth, you call him Jesus because he's fully God and fully human. And then at his death, he's going to bear the sins of mankind. And anyone who will put their trust in him, he will pay for your sins fully on that cross, the love and sacrifice of Jesus. And then he's going to return. But when he's coming to return, he's not returning in a manger. He's not returning to bear sins. He's not returning like a lamb to be slaughtered. No, he's returning to bring the salvation we've been waiting for for so that we will be with him forever and ever. Don't miss his birth, death, resurrection, return. They're all connected. That's the name Jesus. And there's salvation in the name. There's power in the name. There's healing in the name. There's hope in the name. There is no name like the name of Jesus. In life, when it gets turned upside down, you just got to start saying the name. Just say that name, Joseph. Say that name, Mary. Just give him praise, Jesus. Not many are going to understand the fullness of his love. When he loved the children, not everyone understood when he loved the Gentiles, not everyone understood. When he loved the woman at the well who had been divorced many times, not everyone's gonna understand. When he dies on the cross, not everyone's gonna understand. Not everyone's gonna understand and comprehend and appreciate his love, but you just receive it and then give it to the people around you and don't worry if the world doesn't understand it. Jesus Christ his name is Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. That's his name. That's his identity. It's what he does. And what that name says is you can't save yourself. That's what it says. You can't save yourself. I first started to get interested in God in a religion class at Dartmouth. You know what the other religions were teaching? You can save yourself. You can do it through religion and religiosity and rules and rituals. And you know what humanism taught me growing up? You can save yourself. You can save yourself. But this is a defining truth. You can't save yourself. You and I need a savior. We need Jesus. He accomplished it. And this birth right here declares it. Jesus saves. And... Uh, God has a way of turning things around that are upside down. I thought my life and career would just be playing soccer. I had no idea it would be cut short and then God would use soccer to massively spread the gospel. I had no idea when it was cut short. I had no idea when I was fighting for my life for one year and it took 10 years to fully recover. I had no idea that my experience in my 20s through that illness would then become a bridge to minister to people the rest of my life. I had no idea. You don't know how God will use and turn things around. Mary and Joseph, God is still good. Trust him, he still has a plan. And it leads to this. Christmas carries upheaval and glory. Both. Christmas, you may be feeling it now, there's some upheaval and there's also glory. I often feel like we want everything at Christmas neatly wrapped and it's just not how it's gonna play out in this text. It's just not gonna be neatly wrapped. Sometimes we want everything convenient. I just don't see that as the ultimate goal of Christmas is convenience. So what do we have? Look at these verses, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and he took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Good job, Mary and Joseph. You were faithful with the two things God said right there, faithful. And when we read the words to fulfill, you're looking at a link between the New Testament and the Old Testament. It's all God's word. 12 times in the gospel of Matthew to fulfill. 47 times Matthew will link to Old Testament quotes. And why is that? Matthew is reaching a lot of Jewish people and they know the Old Testament, they know scripture, he's talking their language. When you're reaching people, talk their language. When you're reaching engineers, talk their language. When you're reaching athletes, talk their language. When you're reaching artists, talk their language. Talk their language, make sure they understand so they can link it together and hear about Jesus clearly. Isaiah 7, 14, everyone understands this, God 
with us. God is with us. There's no more important words or truth. Nothing more fulfilling, nothing more comforting than God is with us. Mary and Joseph, God has a greater plan and there's a bigger picture. Look at God, look what he's doing. And when they hear what God wants, what do they do? They say yes, they're teachable, and they shift quickly. You know who I love hanging out with? People that say yes to God can be really teachable with God and shift and will move quickly for God when God says to do it. Isn't that when life gets fun? When you're around a group of people that are listening to God, saying yes to God, moving where God wants them to move, teachable, going forward together with God. Mary and Joseph have that in their marriage. They have that in their marriage. I'll tell you, that's the heartbeat of marriage right there. Two people loving each other, listening to God, moving together, where God leads, what, what does God want, praying, walking, stepping by faith together. That's the heartbeat of marriage right here in this passage. They're doing that together. Mary and Joseph, they're gonna break tradition and custom. Are they gonna wait a year like everyone else? That year is cut short, isn't it? Have you ever tried to break a tradition and a custom in a church? My, 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 my. Some of you don't know the wrath of breaking a tradition or a custom in a church. I'm not talking about a biblical command. That's a whole different deal. I'm just talking about a cultural tradition. Some of you don't know the wrath of breaking a cultural preference or tradition in a church. I'm telling you that wrath is real. It's really real. It's really, really real. Protestants love to say, oh, Catholics have that. No, I'm telling you Protestants have that big time, big time. So they're gonna do that. Why? Because they're going for what is right instead of what's culturally approved. They're going for alignment and moving with the Holy Spirit more than the religious crowd. And I'm telling you, God's gonna lead you to those moments where you break the cultural tradition in Jesus' name. Doesn't mean you have to down it. It doesn't mean you have to throw shade on it. You just, it's gonna work for many others, but you walk through it by faith and it's conviction over convenience. It's conviction that they've heard from God. They know what God wants. Would it be more convenient to wait a year? Yes, it would. Would it be more convenient to fit into every cultural nuance then? Yes, it would. But you know what? We're not, we're not doing life to fit in and we're not doing life for convenience. We're doing life with conviction to honor and glorify God. That's at the heart of it. And do you know how much gossip and slander and rumors there's gonna be? Do you know how much they're gonna experience? You ever been on the receiving end of gossip, rumors, slander? Doesn't it hurt more when it's people that were closer to you? Doesn't it hurt more when uh, it's not accurate? Doesn't it hurt more when it comes from people who say they follow Jesus? You know what the devil's work is gossip, slander, and rumors. That is the devil's work. And right now the devil doesn't have to do a lot of work because God's people are doing it for him. They're doing it for him. And so Mary and Joseph, do you know how many flaming darts are gonna come your direction just because you're simply, radically, humbly honoring God, following his conviction and calling? You know what? The religious community is gonna have them for lunch when it comes to gossip, slander, and rumors about what really went down. But don't give those voices too much power. You just have your security in God and his love and you just keep living for Jesus, Mary and Joseph. You just keep living for Jesus. In fact, they're focused on Jesus. If you're here today and you're single, <clears throat> don't be pulled too far. Is it gonna be lonely at times? Yes, it will. Are you gonna wonder at times, am I gonna be married and who's coming along? Yes, you will. Yes, you will. But you know what? Stay focused on Jesus. And you know what? Use the gifts Jesus has given to you. Find some people who love Jesus and you keep walking with Jesus. If you're married today, are there's gonna be times in your relationship where there's strife and tension? A lot of it. Uh, you got two different people, personalities and wills and plans and ideas. Are there gonna be time when that conflict really heats up? Yeah, sometimes it overflows. Sometimes maybe it's passive aggressive. Yes, it does. But you focus on Jesus. Parenting, does it get difficult? 
Does it get sad sometimes? <laughs> Do you have to surrender to God and realize these kids are yours, not mine? Right. Yeah, but you know what? You focus on Jesus. Abiding with Jesus works when you're single, married, and parenting. And abiding with Jesus is the difference maker in this passage. I'll close with this. Holy moments, what do we see here? We see God bringing direction. When God gives you direction, that's a holy moment. What else? We see God bringing joyful confirmation. What is God confirming in your life that you've been praying about and he's confirming and it's bearing fruit? What else? We see a greater trust. Holy moments lead to a greater trust for Mary and Joseph. They're gonna have bigger days ahead. So their trust is growing. And then holy moments leads to a consistency. Mary and Joseph, sure they stumble and fall at different points, but their story is one of consistency. May our legacy be one of consistency in our walk with God. And ultimately, <clears throat> there's a greater glory. The test of being upside down is so you'll demonstrate a greater faith, a greater faith. And trust the God who is always right side up. Trust the God who is gonna be glorified in your life. And the more we trust God, the more God will be glorified. Let's pray. Father God, I pray right now, we pray together from our hearts to seek you, to worship you, God. We lift up the situations that have been disappointing, that have been hurtful. Feels like things are upside down, not where we wanted, not what we planned. They don't make sense. And yet, God, in this moment, we're gonna worship you. We're gonna trust you. We're gonna ask for you to heal and strengthen, to deliver, to bring hope today, God, to encourage and strengthen today, God, to give wisdom today for your glory as we trust you, God. Pour out your blessings in this place. Pour out your blessings as we praise you together. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.